record. Just tell everybody we're recording. Okay, and we have a live transcript going on. We think that's good. Okay, all right. Welcome, welcome, Isaac. It's uh, as I said before, it's good to meet you. This is the first time I'm, I'm meeting you uh, uh, face to face, right? Uh, real time, and we've we've emailed back and forth, and I've had some of uh, of your uh, colleagues uh, from Mexico. I, I don't know if you know everyone there, but uh, so had some really great lectures so far in the series, and we're really looking forward to uh, uh, meeting you. And uh, I wanted to tell uh, everyone a little bit about you. I have your bio here. And so uh, uh, Isaac um, is, uh, is a graduate of the Autonomous University of the Mexico State. Uh, and um, uh, we'll ask you a question. Oh, oh uh, let, let me get let you me on mute here, Samuel. There we go, all right. And he majored in history uh, with a minor in art history, and, and our, our subject tonight is, is uh, around art history and nationalism. Uh, he's a published author. His, his first book, Mirrors, Spaces, and Style, uh, is about Escher and the Dutch tradition, which sounds super interesting. I, I can't wait to take a look at that. And, uh, and then after college, he was hired by a private firm in Mazatlan, uh, Sinaloa, to establish a framework for a, a historical archive of blueprints. Uh, at a recently required abandoned shipyard, which uh, I hope we have a, a few minutes to ask you about that a little bit. And he set up a classification sure. system uh, to put that all together. He's now a, he's an English teacher and working uh, has worked in Mexico City. Um, he continues his education at, at the Bear American University and Central University and at the Lincoln Arts Center in New York and is now in Aguas Calientes, where he is a, a Mexican history teacher. That's right. And, and also teaching English is that uh, as well. It's it's um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's an international school, and uh, history is taught in English. So oh, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> it's an yeah. interesting dynamic. Yeah, sounds actually a lot of fun. So, yeah, yeah. It'd be well, nice to speak some Spanish. So how are things in August Calientes? Is it good? Chilly? Good. It's starting to get a little chilly. Not as chilly as in the north, more northern parts of the hemisphere, but. Um, yeah, things are good. Um, trying to get back into the rhythm of, you know, uh, teaching in person and doing, you know, kind of like normal activities and stuff like that. Trying to stay safe. And so, yeah, but things are good. It's nice to be in the classroom with kids, definitely. Yeah, and are you, mm -hmm. do you teach high school or? Uh, um, I used to teach high school. Now I'm teaching junior high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's yeah. a lot of energy there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they'll drain you, that's for sure. But oh. It's fun. It keeps you going. Mm -hmm. Well, we're looking forward to uh, the topic sure. tonight, and so I, I know it, that you, you know you were going to approach the topic of nationalism, which we talked uh -huh. about before a little bit through music, sure. uh, and you you were going to talk about it through the visual arts, in particular uh -huh. murals in, in right. Mexico. So, right, right. Yeah, looking forward to that. Okay, great. So thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here and I'm really excited to um, share some stuff that you know I prepared on nationalism and um, muralist art, right? So um, kind of like a brief outline of some, you know what I wanted to do in this kind of talk was to talk about first what nationalism really is, then talk a little bit about the origins of nationalism and then nationalism after the revolution. So we're talking about the uh, time of Porfirio Diaz and then the Mexican revolution and then post-revolution after 1921, more or less, 1910, 1921 was the revolution. So, you know, there's kind of two outlooks on nationalism and it's kind of important to understand both of them to get a notion of what uh, Mexican muralism contributed to the arts, right? So finally, we'll look at, you know, some uh, murals and hopefully get through um, to some other unknown people because there's usually three big muralists that uh, are mentioned in the muralist school, you know, in the Mexican muralist school, which is Diego Rivera, uh, David Alfaro Siqueiros and uh, Jose Clemente Orozco. So we're definitely gonna look at them, but hopefully I'll give you at least a chance to participate um, with that. So I want the class to be kind of you know, dynamic. I know it's really weird to have a class um, you know, like this. So the first thing that I wanted to do is if you could, if you have like a smartphone available with a camera, right? If you could scan that code, right? And it's gonna lead you to a web page where the question is what words, ideas, or phrases come to mind when you hear the word nationalism, 
right? So you could maybe write a word or an idea, you know, some kind of phrase, something that kind of, you know, elusive to that. If you can't scan the, the QR code, you can just go to that website down there below. It's menti.com and then it's going to ask you for a code and um, you can punch in that code. So it's 1963. Hopefully we get some good participation. The more people participate, the better the word cloud is going to be. So this is basically to set this off here. Let me just transfer the... Okay, cool. So I got some, okay, good. We got some answers here. So the idea is that your answers are going to be shown on this screen here. So let's take a couple more minutes to, um, to get some more answers, right? So we have some answers here from the crowd. We have a national anthem, uh, belonging, patriotism, propaganda, USA, country, patriotic, current events, capitalism. Right. A couple more here. Good, we're getting more and more. So I'll just give it a couple minutes. And you guys can kind of look at other people's answers too and see how they, you know, kind of relate. Obviously, the bigger they are, the more um, people put them, right? So it seems that culture, pride, and patriotism seem to be similar themes, right? And I like the answer. I don't know who um, put current events, right? But current events is very interesting because what is nationalism is basically like a very current question, right? I think a country always tries to identify, like to define what their nationality means, who they are as a people, as a culture, with their language, with the arts. You know, some people put folk arts here, right? I'm not sure if someone put language or not. Right there it is, you know, language towards the center, group identity, excessive pride. So also like we can see that there's both positive and negative aspects to nationalism, right? Like there's definitely a sense of belonging, but then we get into, you know, like propaganda and pride. And so it could be good or bad as it says there at the uh, bottom, right? So as we look towards that, I want you guys to keep that in mind, right? As we can see, it's a very complex kind of subject to kind of define, no? So um, what I wanna do here is continue with a little bit about what nationalism meant in the Porfiriato, right? Which is prior to the revolution, right? So basically, Right. In order to understand any kind of American history, be it in South America, in North America, Central America, wherever, we have to also keep in mind the European context. Right. And so we're, when we're talking about the 19th century, we're talking about the Industrial Revolution. We're talking about Darwinism, which is going to be essential to our definition of nationalism, um, Romanticism. Right. And with the Mexican context, we're talking about like post-Civil War, we're talking about instability, there's a kind of anti-church sentiment, there's an anti-military sentiment, there's a search for identity and a search for democracy, right? So the question arises that how does Mexico kind of insert itself into an international community that values progress and science after such a long period of instability? So along comes the Porfiriato and they kind of try to give it a solution, then, right? So a couple of philosophers real quickly from the uh, Porfiriato, kind of people who define Mexican nationalism, one of them was Justo Sierra, right? And Justo Sierra kind of saw the future of Mexico in the mestizo population, right? Um, as we all know, you know, the territory of Mexico was not always Mexico prior to the independence, it was New Spain. And it was a colony and prior to that, it was Mesoamerica with, so it was kind of like the breed of the Spanish and the European culture with all of that history in the back, right? And kind of the result was the mestizo um, population in Mexico, right? So around this time is when Darwin also kind of published his, um, his uh, theory on the um, on natural selection, right? And so these gentlemen, Justo Sierra and the next gentleman I'm gonna to talk to you about, they kind of apply it to um, society, right? And we'll get back to that in a second. 
So basically they define progress as economic growth, right? So for example, here in Aguascalientes, it was a city that saw huge investment in railway systems, right? Like in the railroad, it was just like a huge, huge um, uh, motor figuratively and literally for economic growth, right? There were also public works, public construction, right? So um, one of the authors that I was reading talked about how these definitions were kind of very contradictory, right? Because on one hand, it was like, yes, we need to be national, we need to do it ourselves. But most of the investment was foreign, you know, um, in terms of the railway systems, in terms of oil infrastructure, you know? So there's kind of like a lot of contradictions as we'll see throughout the presentation, right? So um, also the, the idea of hero is very important. You know? Another gentleman who was also a philosopher during the Porfiriato era was Vicente Riva Palacio, right? And he also agreed that the history of Mexico was a history of mixed races. Right? But he believed that it was thanks to America, I'm sorry, it was thanks to the conquest that America had kind of been exposed to and united to Europe in some way, and it was able to attain a certain state of culture, right? So there's kind of like a, um, I don't know, a lessening of importance towards, you know, contributions from Mesoamerica and all this, because they're saying that thanks to Europe, we're able to attain this state of liberty and civilization, right? So um, unfortunately, you know, for, for the, the muralist's sake, you know, he based his ideals on foreign principles, right? But the muralists, as we'll see, were not so, you know, different, okay? So basically, you know, see, as Darwin kind of like proposed, he said that, you know, from the mix of two species or two races, right? Obviously, you know, the concept of race and that that's, you know, outdated, but in this time, you know, it was kind of like this mix of two species of races would kind of create a better, you know, and a more improved or, a, you know, uh, a more befitted for survival uh, type of species, right? So, um, <laughs> Palacio <clears throat> and Sierra kind of believed the same thing that it was this breed between the indigenous past in Mesoamerica and the Spanish, you know, uh, past in Europe that would breed this mestizo and it was like there where all hope and all future of Mexico lied, right? So they became kind of like a privileged member of society and progress and growth would kind of depend on this kind of like middle, middle upper class, you know, race. Again, I don't like to use the word race, but you know, that's how they refer to it there, right? So again, the contradiction, you know, is that yes, we're Mexican and yes, we do it all on our own, but it's like foreign and it's, you know, upper class investment, right? So the consequences out of the Porfiriato derive, you know, there's a privileged middle and upper class, um, you know, and as a consequence, knowledge, culture, art, you know, literature, music, theater, they're restricted to these social strata. Right. As we're going to see now in the more visual part of the presentation, right, iron is privileged and there's a lot of construction of public spaces. There's an influence of the Art Nouveau movement from France. Right? And so by the end of the Porfiria, I'm sorry, by the end of the Porfiriato, there's just a complete aperture towards foreign ideas, foreign investment, foreign everything. Right. So this kind of creates well, let's look at some of the results from the Porfirat, right? So this is the Palacio de Bellas Artes. This is downtown Mexico City. It's about maybe a 10 minute walk from the Socalo Square where the National Palace is and everything like that. And right? so, as you can see, this is a very, you know, European building. There's kind of like some elements from, you know, the neoclassical period. There's also, you know, there's the international style that's going on around the end of the 19th century, right? There's this kind of iron and metal, right? Very similar to, for example, the Palais Garnier in Paris, right? Which was built only maybe, what, 70 years before, 60 years before, right? So as you can see, there's some really striking similarities between what was being done in Europe and what was being imported by the Porfiriato to kind of define 
you know, the, their period of stability and their period of peace. Right? Another, uh, you can actually see this building in the, fir in the first picture that I showed you. It's off to the right here. This is the, um, the, the uh, male palace, I guess, the Palacio de Correos. Right. So there's definitely, I mean, there's a whole lot of, you know, international styles that this, you know, could evoke, you know, starting from the Medici Palace in Italy to other, you know, like to Gothic style to, you know, more uh, classical style um, and stuff like that. So it's kind of like a whole mix on the outside. You know? But if we go to the inside, you know, it's actually... You know, there's a, a kind of an influence there of Art Nouveau, but this is definitely not a Mexican architecture. This is definitely imported, right? So um, obviously this is a, a beautiful building. If anyone is ever in town in Mexico City, please go see these buildings, right? Because they're beautiful. And actually some of the murals that we're gonna look at are on the third floor of the Palacio de Bellas Artes, right? So it's kind of like a nice mix there of these two periods, right? So in terms of the plastic, yeah, I'm sorry, in terms of painting, right? We have this, um, this painting here, right? It's by Jose Obregón, painted in 1869, right? and it's called The Discovery of Pulque. I don't know, does anyone know what pulque is here? Is anyone uh, familiar with the drink? Anyone want to share? So it's not just me talking. No? Okay, so pulque is, uh, I see someone is in the chat. Um, okay, so yeah. So uh, pulque is this fermented drink from the maguey plant. It's a cactus, very, you know, common here. Um, most of it know, most of it here, uh, or internationally know it because tequila also comes from the maguey plant, right? Close to here in Aguascalientes is Jalisco, which is one of the biggest producers of maguey. And so anyway, pulque was kind of more towards the center and it's a fermented drink and it's an alcoholic drink, right? And so basically this painting that we're looking at is this the story of this young woman named Sochi who discovered this drink, pulque, and presented it. This was around 900 um, you know, of the common era, right? So 900 on this side. And um, this was the, in Tula, right? And so the, the king that we see here, the leader is, I had to write it down because I'm always bad with these names. And um, it's Tecpan Calcini. I'm sorry, Tec, Tecpan Calcini. Tecpan Calcin, right? So Tecpan Calcin is presented with this fermented drink, right? And he likes it. And not only does he like the uh, drink, he also falls in love with the girl who discovered it and they get married, right? Later on in the Porfiriato, it's actually discovered that this was a misread of some neo-Hispanic documents and that that story never really happened. That it was actually a different kind of drink based on like honey, and um, I think they decant the honey and ferment it in some way. So it's not actually the discovery of pulque, but it's something else, right? So again, we're, we're talking about a time period that imported art, right? Yes, mead, exactly. It's a mead-like drink. Yeah, someone put here in the chat something similar to mead. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Khalid. So again, we're importing art. And as I looked at this composition, when we talk about the composition of a painting, obviously we're talking about the, you know, the forms and how they relate, right? So I couldn't help but think of this other painting here um, by the French painter Jacques-Louis uh, Jacques David. And so there's a very striking, similar compositional aspect where, for example, we have this doorway here that opens to a different room, right? And again, here, a doorway that opens to a different room, right? There's kind of like a triangular composition going on here to the right. And there's also kind of like a triangular, you know, and at the center where the, the treatment of light is, obviously we have just the main event. Right. So anyway, I'm not saying that this is just, you know, um, that this is a copy or anything, but it does resemble many of these compositions from um, neoclassical painting. Right. 
Um, if anyone has any questions or doubts or they see something that jumps out at them, please feel free to interrupt. Right? Um, so another Porfiriato painting, uh, painter, Juan Cordero, Christopher Columbus in the Court of the Catholic Kings. Again, this evokes a lot of European art, you know, the treatment of light, um, the dark background, and, you know, um, there's many different periods that, you know, we don't have time to discuss, right? Because I want to get to the meat, the, the, the murals, right? This last, uh, this last uh, artist here, oh, I forgot, I didn't put the name, but this is Jose Maria Velasco, right? And Jose Maria Velasco was one uh, of the more famous painters from the Porfiriato for his landscape paintings. Right? But the reason I chose this one is, first of all, because of its uh, symbolism. You know, it still is a Porfiriato painting in that we see a church, for example, obviously is a symbol for, you know, like, um, you know, the, uh, yeah, religion, right? And the bridge on the left towards the center, also a symbol kind of for progress, for building, things like that. Well, what's kind of new and what kind of points us in this new direction that, you know, uh, the muralists are going to take and the new school is going to take is what's down in the composition below, right? This kind of modern, you know, like a scene from daily life. You know, we see some people washing their clothes. We see another person walking here. So, you know, the question arises, right? What does the revolution do, right? Because after 30 years of the Porfiriato, not only in the arts, but also socially, there wasn't more, there wasn't much, um, you know, social movement going on, right? Um, this group of gentlemen here called the Athenaeum of the Youth, right? It's kind of like the new school after Porfiriato, and they actually called on Diego Rivera, but he left in 1904, I think it was, to Europe. And so he was in Europe, but he had contact with some of these people. And um, so they had this feeling that nothing happened, that everything was boring, art was really privileged, it was very pompier. And so they decide to kind of take things into their own hands, right? And they start talking about heroes and they say, okay, so what does it mean to you know, be Mexican after the revolution? Right? If we're not French, if we're not Spanish, if we're not European, then what are we, right? And so we have to kind of achieve a cultural independence, right? Through a moral regeneration, kind of values of um, heroes, right? And so instead of like this uh, social Darwinism, let's talk about free will, you know, that people can kind of forge their own destinies. Right. Instead of, you know, positivism, let's talk about a return to the classics. Right. This time of the Mexican muralism is commonly referred to as kind of like a Mexican renaissance, not only because they looked at Greek philosophers and their definitions of progress in this, but also because it was, in a way, a certain rebirth of the arts. Right? So a couple of things before we look at the murals. Right. Basically, the new government wants to portray a message of unity, right? Through kind of an official history for people who don't know how to read, right? Um, so it's a representation of cultural values between the native Indian and also the mestizo, right? One of the things that makes it really difficult to talk about murals in general, right, is the size. First of all, we'll look at it on a compositional level, but also just, the artists have a very, if you're painting on an easel or on a canvas, you can very easily kind of control the composition and limit it. But when you're talking about these huge buildings, in many cases, like two or three stories of the same building, right? The composition becomes really a problem and you have to kind of start overlapping things, right? So it's difficult to read them because you need to have knowledge of events. You need to have uh, knowledge of processes, historical figures, symbols, no. So how popular can it really be? Obviously, one needs to be very well versed in Mexican history to kind of interpret these, right? So we'll start in that sense with Diego Rivera. Right? Diego Rivera um, painted this mural here in the National Palace, very close to the buildings that I showed you at the beginning, right? And um, 
so as you can see, kind of, like I said, it's very difficult to talk about these murals. Ideally, we should be in the building and we should all be looking at these massive, you know, figures. But uh, for now, you know, towards the middle, you can kind of see the front wall, but this part here off to the left would be on our left side. And then this would be on our right. right? So think of it as kind of like a three-dimensional space. Um, so there's a lot going on here. Right towards the right, we kind of see this uh, this origin, you know, uh, outlook, you know, pre-Hispanic Mesoamerica. Right, we see, for example, Quetzalcoatl here towards the center. We see the, excuse me, the pyramids, you know, the volcanoes, Quetzalcoatl leaving, you know, kind of like all the all the figures. Right, they're not European figures right? They're indigenous figures. That's what defines Mexico now, right? Remember, we're not French, we're not Spanish, we're not European. Right? So to the right of that mural, we see kind of like the origin. To the left, right, we see Rivera's vision of the future for the Mexican worker, right? Remember, this, this mural here is 1929, so this is right between World War I and World War II. Right? So we can see a lot of familiar faces here, for example, Karl Marx um, up here, right? And we see kind of like a future of struggle, you know, we see campesinos, we see huelga here, which means strike in English, right? Uh, I'm sorry, in Spanish, right? So kind of like the struggle, you know, obviously Rivera is the more political one of the three, right? And so he's always going to paint history as a class struggle, right? And any good historian knows that that's not the only way to look at history. It's an interesting way, but it's not the only way, right? So here, for example, would be the future. No? Towards the middle here, we have kind of his view of history, right? What is between Mexico's past and Mexico's future? Here is Rivera's uh, vision. Right. So we have towards the right, we have the uh, Reforma and Juarez era, which was prior to the Porfiriato. Right. We have the independence and we have the Mexican Revolution. We have the Porfirian era here and we have the French uh, and Maximiliano to the left. Right. Towards the bottom here, we have the Spanish conquest. Right. So there's also that vision and that reality, you know, that you know, and it's kind of obviously there's a compositional message here that this is the base you know, for everything else that kind of progressed afterwards. You know? um, interesting, for example, a detail here, right? And I thought of looking for an eagle from the Porfiriato era, but then I noticed that I didn't even have to, right? Because it's right here in the image. You know? Here we see a more um, Mexican eagle. Right. This one here symbolizes the Porfiriato eagle kind of being knocked over. Right. And again, and so, for example, we have these warriors, um, you know, in Mesoamerica, there was the eagle warrior and there was the jaguar warrior. Right? So we can see them here. Right? So this is a very interesting take on a very common national symbol here in Mexico. Right? If we continue on to this mural here. This one has a great story. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to comment maybe on what they see towards the center, right? Like I said, this is a very difficult medium because you, there's a lot going on. So we kind of have to know how to read these. This one, you could kind of start at the center and work your way out. You know? So we can look at the title, Man at the Crossroads. Kind of think about What's going on? What do you see? What's, you know, what jumps out at you? If you guys wanna chat or if you wanna open the microphone up, it feels very new age, okay. New age, all right, in what sense? Anyone else? Well, I believe maybe a response. Something that stands out to me a lot is the um, imagery in what seems to be the wings. Uh huh. Okay, yeah, the wings of, of the man here at the center. Uh, yes. What kind of images do you see? This was, uh, I'm sorry, was this Andrew, Anthony? I, I didn't catch uh, the uh, name. Um, it's uh, Khaled. Okay. Um, it's, it's tricky because you look on the 
the outer portions of the mural, you see a lot of depictions of mankind, you know, wars, mm -hmm. politics, and mm -hmm. class, and a lot of that kind of stuff. But then in the center, it almost seems more abstract or celestial, like it looks okay. like clouds and planets and skies. And definitely. And I, I can't quite tell what is in the center. I, I can tell there's uh, a hand gripping something, but I can't. But I can't make out what's uh, inside that globe. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I see some other people put something here. The crowd in the back. Samuel says the crowd in the back gives a futuristic perspective on the people's clothing and jewelry. All right. Okay. Thank you. But I agree with what he just said. Thank you. And it also says the man looks like he's at the crossroads of different dimensions. Excellent, right? So as Kali just mentioned, right, there's kind of like the clouds and the celestial and the planets and all this kind of stuff, no? So that's kind of like the macro level, no? And then here, it's more difficult, obviously, to attain. This one is one of the murals that you would find in the Palacio de Bellas Artes. It's on the third floor, if you're ever there go up and like experience this in all of its glory right they got benches there and you can really delve into it but here our clue is the microscope right so the microscope here kind of gives us this journey and this kind of idea into you know um i don't know cells bacteria you know whatever you might want to look you know so there's the macro and the micro aspect no and if we look at this um the title is called man at the crossroads for a reason there's a great story behind this mural this mural was co commissioned by um rockefeller jr right and he, he commissioned something like please show um man at the center of uh technological progress or something like that, right? And so he hired Diego Rivera. And I don't think he knew what he was really getting into, although Rockefeller later said that he knew his art, right? So Rivera goes to New York at the Rockefeller Center and he starts painting this mural and everything's going great. And then lo and behold, towards the center right over here, this gentleman appears here. Does anyone know who this is? <laughs> It's difficult because of the image now, but this is Lenin, right? This is Vladimir Lenin, right? Yeah, exactly, there we go. Lenin, Lenin, thank you, right? So we have Lenin over here, and then off to the right, the image is cut off, but there's, I think Trotsky's over here as well, right? So Rockefeller Jr. comes down and he sees this and he loses his mind. He says, what's going on, right? I didn't ask for this. And so he asked Rivera to paint over it, and Rivera says, well, you know what? I'll make a compromise. I'll paint, I'll paint an Abraham Lincoln in there somewhere, right? And so Rockefeller says no. And like, he becomes very upset. And this mural ends up being kind of like cut out of the wall. And it's where it is today. That's why at the bottom here, I put the Rockefeller Center and Palacio de Bellas Artes, right? So that's the story behind that mirror. But yes, there's a lot going on and it's kind of like man at the center of the crossroads and kind of like with this technology, he can do good things and he can do bad things, no? Mankind can, you know, progress and struggle for workers' rights. I have this allusion here kind of like to the Olympics, no? So there's this, obviously agriculture is at the base of all this. We can't forget, you know, we, we can't do any of this without agriculture. No, but just as we can do that, you know, we can, you know, repress workers. For example, here we have a policeman kind of repressing some workers over here. No, this was right after World War One, kind of right before World War Two. Fascism was definitely going around in Europe, right? A lot of these artists were going to Europe, so they were experimenting many of these things, and you know, they had to portray it in some way, no? and they had to express it in some way. No, um, so here you know here's some detail ah there's there's trotsky there's marx right so obviously rockefeller the capitalist that he was couldn't you know wouldn't stand for this no? so um anyway there's some details there right this one here's another uh diego rivera mural right and this one here is in the um public education secretariat right 
Um, yeah, someone says it looks like Chinese communists. Okay. Um, so yeah, this mural here is actually really interesting because it's one of these murals that has like three stories. And between the stories, Rivera decided to put like in the staircases scenes from natural and human life throughout history, right? So we see, for example, this one here, here's the stairwell, right? And you can see kind of like this garden, you can see kind of like, um, you know, the plants, the, the wildlife, the habitat, obviously the, the, the clothing, very typical, right? We would see kind of like a settlement back here. A bridge, obviously symbolizing progress, and it's a bridge for a train. So there's the whole allusion to that, right? But what jumps out at me- Excuse me, may I uh, interrupt yes. to ask a question? I'm sorry. Um, were all of these murals by um, Diego Rivera, or was the first one by someone else? Um, these, yes, these are all from, uh, these are Diego Rivera murals. Okay. We're gonna look at some, uh -huh. we're gonna Thank look you. at some, uh -huh. We're going to look at some other ones, but yes, these are Rivera. We'll look at Siqueiros and Orozco in a second, right? So this is a very, um, you know, I think it's one floor below the one that I just showed you, right? This is Xochipili, right? Xochil in Nahuatl means flower, right? So this is the god goddess, I believe, of flowers, right? And so again, we see very natural, you know, there's again the, you know, natural elements like the, the flora, the fauna, we have this bird here, the plants, you could almost, you know, it could be a botanist dream to kind of like go through this and maybe see what plants, you know, Rivera was maybe representing, maybe they're real, right? But what jumps out at me again is kind of like this influence that, you know, I can't seem to shake off right, from Europe, because remember, Rivera and Orozco and Siqueiros, they all spent time in Europe, right? So what jumped out at me as I saw this was it evoked some images of Cezanne, uh, I'm sorry, of Gauguin, right, in the time where he went to uh, Polynesia to paint, right? Now, again, it's not similar, it's not exactly the same thing, like the first uh, comparison that I drew, but there are, you know, there's definitely some influence here, right? And there's no doubt that Rivera had contact with Gauguin and that school in, um, in Europe in his time there, right? So um, another beautiful artwork by Rivera, the last one that we're gonna look at is the bath uh, in the river. It's also known as the bath of Tehuantepec. And so this is in the Sumaya Museum in Mexico City between the gift shop and the bathrooms, right? I kid you not. And so this is a mosaic. Again, I can't, you know, a lot, those of you who are familiar with Gauguin's work would probably agree with me that there's some similarities there, at least color-wise and compositionally-wise, the figures, you no, know, the movement, you no, know, there's, you know, it's not impressionist per se, but, you know, post-impressionist or even post-post-impressionist, definitely, there's something there. No. So um, here's another close up of this. I don't know how we're doing. I hope we're doing okay on time. Okay, so I need to pick it up. <laughs> All right, so uh, David Alfaro Siqueiros, right? He was technologically and compositionally the most radical of the big three. Okay, he believed that rev uh, revolutionary art required revolutionary revolutionary materials and techniques, right? So he did a lot of concave wall compositions. He used chemicals and paints traditionally used for cars, right? He rejected Italian frescoes in, uh, in favor of new technological advances. I think somewhere in my reading, <laughs> I saw that he used the maguey plant to kind of as an adhesive with, uh, you know, experimentation, right? So this one is um, a great example of just the size and the massive, um, you know, element of, of these murals, right? Um, this is clearly two stories and this is kind of like a polygonal perspective. What does that mean? If you look towards the bottom here, you kind of get the sense that you're looking down, you no? Know? Maybe from a second or a third story, you no? Know? And so you get this feeling that you're looking down as you're looking down the stairs, right? And then kind of, you know, kind of shifts the perspective here. Then we have a frontal perspective. And as you move up and you go towards the ceiling, you look up and you see this. 
So this is, you know, definitely a huge contribution from, you know, cicadas, kind of like this polygonal perspective and this inclusion of everything surrounding and just completely immersing your, you know, the spectator in this, um, yeah, in this stairwell. You know? So here's a detail, for example, of the um, of the, the the mural is called Portrait of the Bourgeoisie. Right. And it's in the uh, building for the Mexican Electricist Syndicate. Right. So here's a detail. Right. Again, right, we can find pre-Hispanic elements on the, on the right side. That's a really easy side to kind of interpret. We see the feathered serpent down here. Right. We see indigenous people here. The left side's a little more, you know, kind of striking and difficult to interpret it at first. But as we kind of interpret it, we kind of see a shape come, you know, we see the horse hooves here, right? And then, so we, we see that it's a horse and he's on two legs and he's kind of kicking back. And we clearly a representation for the Spaniard, right? We have the cross here, obviously that whole symbolism of the religious, um, you know, uh, indoctrination or, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know? So um, again, you know, another Siquedos one, one that alludes to the revolution. This one is in the Chapultepec castle. And this is only a detail. This is actually a very, very long um, mural as well. And so here we see kind of like the, um, yes, the cross, I'm sorry. Yeah, we have back here, the cross resembles a blade, right? We have it here. Right? So yeah, definitely, you know, there's a blade here, obviously, again, very violent imagery, you know? remember. Um, Siqueiros, I believe, I think it was Siqueiros, yeah, he actually volunteered for the Spanish Civil War. So, you know, there's that whole tradition, I think Orwell did it as well, Hemingway did it as well, you know, there were a lot of writers, artists that all volunteered to go off into the Spanish Civil War, right? So they were, were really living violent times. They just lived the revolution, you know, World War I, um, you know, the, the Russian Revolution, you know, it was a, definitely a time of social turmoil. You know? um, another Siqueiros one that is also in the Palace of um, Fine art, Bellas Artes, downtown, right, is this one here called the Torment of Guautemoc. Right? So there's a lot of things here, you know, that, that we could spend, again, hours looking at something like this. Uh -huh. There's a lot of things that strike our attention, the way the, the Spaniards are represented, uh -huh. the kind of diagonal composition here, the treatment of light, darkness over here, a little more light, obviously the, the fire, you know. Temoc, the last uh, Mayan um, king, I'm looking for that. Tlatuani is the Nahuatl name, right? So the last Tlatuani being tormented here. And over here, towards the back, behind this person, this person here, I believe is an allusion to Malintzin or La Malinche, right? which was kind of like that first contact between Cortes and um, the indigenous tribes here in, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I was reading the comments, right? But yeah, uh, I lost my train of thought, yeah. So uh, the contact between Cortes and the indigenous tribes, no? uh, La Malinche, there's a whole, you know, stigma, you know, there's a whole thing with La Malinche and what it means to be, for example, in Mexico, a Malinchista. Right, someone who talks down on Mexico or you know uh, Mexican ideas or you know prefers something external. No, they say ah, it's malinchista, right? And it comes from this historical figure here, which is debatable, but um, yeah, right. Um, great, I'm glad that you're enjoying Siqueiro's work. Yes, it definitely is good. Every time I go to Bellas Artes, it's not like I go every weekend, but when I do go, I, I go and I look at this and I look at this mural and the thing that I can't stop looking at is the dog in the center, right? That dog is just so intimidating, so vicious, you know? And Siqueiro just does an amazing job of portraying, you know, anger and yeah, viciousness, 
I don't know if anyone wants to comment something on uh, Cicado. Um, I was going to say the, um, the, the dog in the center. I feel like because this is just me personally, but due mm -hmm. to the, um, the Spaniards wearing all the, the masks and the suit of armor, it feels very impersonal or you don't sense too much coming from them. So it's almost like the dog sort of represents them, like a, a face representing That's um, an excellent the behavior. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent read because yeah, and very similar, um, thank you again, I'm oh, sorry, very similar to this kind of anonymity that we see with, you know, the gentleman on the horse, right? There's no face, you know, into the indigenous tribes to the Indians here in Mexico, it was like, who are these people, right? So yeah, um, that's a great, that's a great read on that. Um, so let's move on to Orozco, right? Orozco, Jose Clemente Orozco had more success than others, right? And this basically had to do a lot with the type of institutions, right? It wasn't like a private institution like the Rockefeller Center that could just, you know, censor whatever. These tended to be universities and, you know, other places that kind of respected, you know, intellectual property, right? And so he was uh, less political than Rivera and Siqueiros, Right? He was left less uh, comfortable with the, you know, kind of violent aspects of the revolution, right? He also spent time in Europe and he was super influenced by Cubism, right? So <clears throat> in the beautiful city of Guadalajara, if you go downtown, you'll see this lovely neoclassical building called El Hospicio Cabañas, right? And it was uh, designed by the Mexican architect Manuel Tolsa, who was a very, very uh, prolific architect, right, in towards the end of the 18th century, right? So he designed this building. And so, yeah, you might say, why are we looking at a neoclassical building? That's not really what I wanna show you, right? If you're ever in Guadalajara, you need to go inside the Hospicio Cabañas and you need to look at the murals painted by Orozco. Right. And they're set up now. This is obviously you will never see it like this unless you, I don't know, are very important and can rent it in some way. No, but usually there's a lot of people here. But what's beautiful about the Hospicio Cabañas is that they have these huge, like wide benches, right? And they're meant so you go and you lay down and you look up at the ceiling and you look at these amazing murals, right? And so, for example, this is. This does not do it justice at all, right? I apologize for that. But if you're ever in Guadalajara, please go to Hospicio Cabañas and look at these murals, right? On the right, for example, on the right uh, third part of the image that we're looking at, we have Cortes, right? And he's kind of standing over the, um, the yeah, the Mexican Indian, right? And there's blood. Right. But what jumps out at me, I, I've, I've visited it twice, maybe. And the first time that I jumped, that I saw it, I was a college student. And so I was reading about, you know, the, the, the conquest and the revolution and Mexican history. And one of the things that really jumped out at me from Cortes was kind of like this mechanical being. No, this mechanical, you know, his armor, his knees, really, you know, just kind of like those nuts and bolts going right through the knee. You know, so there's definitely the allusion to the whole technological, you know, industrial aspect of it, especially in the middle one, you know, where really it's difficult to discern, but it's kind of like a sword and then just kind of like a cubist, an abstract cubist, a geometrical cubist representation. On the left, we would have to kind of turn our heads around and we see that it's actually a horse, right? And it's someone riding a horse. So again, these images don't do it justice, but like you have to imagine these huge, I mean, it's the ceiling to this building that we're looking at, right? And so you can imagine how massive these things are, right? And it's everywhere, right? I see I have a comment in the chat, so, uh -huh. yeah, exactly. This melting of man and machine, right? So here in the Hospicio Cabañas, the, he actually painted two versions of Cortes, right? And this is another version that you can find there, right? Um, again, this whole mechanical thing, you know, 
very imposing, very intimidating, almost faceless, the beard, you know, um, and obviously the massacred people under him. You know? So there's a whole power structure that's being shown. You know? um, last but not least, we have um, this fresco that is in the Museum of Modern Art in um, New York. Right? And it's called the dive bomber in the tank. And so Orozco said that he wasn't political, right? But this tends to be a very political fresco when we start thinking about what it represents. And at first it might be a little difficult to ascertain what's being shown. And actually I was reading the MoMA website was talking about how these can actually, they're meant to be interchangeable. So you could arrange them in basically any manner that you want, but it's basically the remains of a bomber airplane and a tank. And so you have chains, now you have kind of like, obviously, I don't know, this alludes to kind of like some legs. So obviously there's death there. And so kind of like, it's not a critique, it's not political, you know, but it is political. Now he kind of laughed it off and said, well, it's not political. It can be whatever you want it to be, but, you know, you name it dive bomber and tank and you use this imagery and this color scheme, it's difficult to avoid political, you know, messages. You know? Definitely, I also noticed that, um, Kali, the, you know, kind of like the faces with the bolts kind of, you know, thrust into their eyes. You know? it's, um, it's very, yeah, again, it's very violent imagery, you no? Know? Subtle at first, you know? Um, okay, so basically, what can we conclude, right? So the aesthetic and post-revolutionary art, right? The revolution was felt in the world of art because, for example, the school of the Porfiriato, the Academy of San Carlos, they went on strike against its director, Rivas Mercado, right? And so Vasconcelos kind of founded the open air school of painting. Education is seen as a means of freedom and progress. Liberalism triumphs. It's a step away from religion, right? So basically, Rivera, Orozco, Siqueiros, they all seek to, you know, move painting away from the canvas. You know? To them, a canvas painting is a bourgeoisie painting, you know? is an aristocratic painting, and that's not what they want. They want public art monuments for everyone, right? Which I kind of question because if these murals are in the palace of, you know, in the National Palace, and that's actually where our current president lives, Right? Like, it's not very easy for me to go and see those and experience it as a public art. You know? Some of them are more accessible, but they tend to be in universities and, you know, like syndicates and stuff like that. So it's not like, hey, I'm going to check out these murals. You know? um, others tend to be more accessible. There's one, for example, in the Detroit Institute of Art um, by Diego Rivera, which is an amazing uh, allegory on the whole, you know, Detroit automobile technological industry, you know, um, context there. And what's beautiful about those murals is above, he is kind of like the four races of man. So we get back to this idea of races and then we have land. Uh, and so basically what he's saying is that, you know, the, the industry and the automobiles and everything would not be possible without the extraction of minerals from the land. Right. So again, anyway, that's from that's from Detroit. You can look at that one. That one's really beautiful as well. Right. So basically, they want an art for workers, campesinos, soldiers, intellectuals not committed to the bourgeoisie. So the question arises: Was it successful? No. It was definitely a group effort. No. In spite of that, there were these famous three personalities. You know. Um, like I said, it was referred to as a Mexican Renaissance, you know? and this wouldn't have been possible without the contributions of archaeology and anthropology here in Mexico, right? Towards the beginning of the century, of the 20th century, right, there's a whole kind of push to rediscover, you know, uh, Mayan ruins in Yucatan or, you know, um, Mexica ruins towards the center of the, of the country. Right. And so, again, kind of like this Renaissance and this kind of is the natural involvement from Europe. It kind of takes like 60 years to get over here. Right. But in Europe, you know, there was the discovery of Pompeii in the 19th century. Right. So, you know, there's that whole similarity there. 
right? It was also successful in terms that it countered cultural movements, right? So yes, it's public, but again, how, you know, we can't just say that, yes, it was Mexican rah, 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 because as we saw, we saw influence from Impressionism, we saw influence from uh, Cubism, you know? We saw even other images and other reading, like, it's unfortunate that we don't have more time, but there's like um, Renaissance, and some of them even look to me like compositions of Giotto, which are without perspective, but just figures kind of like put over each other, no? So the artists were definitely aware that they were bringing in European contributions, right? So it was successful, I guess, in the terms that, you know, there were no copies. There were kind of original reserve, original results, no? Its own art, its own school, its own message, but with, you know, European, excuse me, influence, right? Um, and so lastly, right, I'm not sure how we're doing on time. I think that's, that's, that's right on time, but I wanted to show you guys quickly, um, just kind of like a list of other Mexican muralists that um, you should definitely look into, right? I would add to this list also, um, um, it'll come back to me. Oh, from Toluca. Leopoldo Flores, but he's not so much from, you know, this time period. I would stick with these guys here. Um, and yeah, and just as with all art time periods, there's always kind of like, I refer to them kind of as like the rock stars of the period. You no, know, there's the Michelangelo's and the Caravaggio's and the, you know, uh, the Da Vinci's that everyone remembers, but there's so many other unknown artists that um, need to be explored and their work kind of needs to be revalued as well. You know? So lastly, if we could kind of go into this uh, scanning of the code dynamic again, I'd like you guys to scan, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to, you guys to scan this code here and kind of like reflect on maybe something that you take from this lecture or something that you learned something that so you're gonna you know it's gonna pop up a screen and there's gonna be at the bottom right corner like a plus sign or addition sign so you could write your answer there right and as soon as everyone kind of like i'll give a moment to scan this and then i'll project people's answers and i don't know if there's um questions comments complaints anything that you guys want to contribute i'd be great i'd be very happy to hear um your opinion on this, but you can write it also, right? So go ahead and scan that for me. And let me go into the, um, so this is the, Okay, I don't know, were, were people able to, to scan the, maybe there's something that, I don't know, that's the problem with relying too much on like new apps and technologies and stuff like that, that sometimes they don't work, but I don't know if you guys were able to open that and write into it, but if not, you guys can kind of like contribute, you know, um, to write into, uh, Ah, okay, so I need to resend it. Okay, give me one second. I'll project it again. <clears throat> so here it is. And we'll give it another shot. Ah, there we go. Cool. Now we got some answers. All right. So, um, the art allowed me to experience the history of another culture through a unique lens, inspiring me further as an artist in musical ways, despite the murals being visual. They're a world that signs visually. 
that sings visually. Definitely, right? Definitely. There's a whole musical aspect to it. And the music of the Porfiriato and of the revolution, definitely something that um, you would want to look into, right? Um, Rivera Rousseau. I saw Rivera Rousseau. Um, amazing that you captured these massive works in the Zoom. I tend to, I beg to differ, right? If you can, whenever you can, please travel to Mexico City and experience some of these murals. They're really um, something that completely just overtakes you, right? And I mentioned in, you know, in my presentation that, you know, I was going to talk about the dangers of nationalism, right? And just quickly, you know, what I meant by that is just that this art, there's kind of like one of the comments at the beginning was that nationalism was very related to propaganda. Right. And so I think that Rockefeller, even though he was definitely censoring art, you know, he was definitely like aware of something like that. No, he was saying that, you know, like this could be propaganda. What is this commie propaganda doing on my, you know, territory or whatever, you know? So definitely there's a line that you want to straddle between art and propaganda and brainwashing and this idea of the hero and Miguel Hidalgo saved the indigenous people when that's not really true. He just didn't want to pay taxes, you know, things like that, right? Um, so organic sensual images juxtaposed with machine. The art allowed me to, uh, that was that. Uh, more Mexican art that was on a political side, definitely. Murals portray the values of peoples at that time from portraying religion to their feelings about war. Excellent. Seeing what the art portrays across history is very fascinating to see. Thanks for this presentation. Um, yeah, so I want to thank you guys um, for joining me. I, you know, wish we could be in front of these murals talking in person, but um, I hope that you enjoyed it. And it was for me a privilege to kind of prepare this and to share my experience with you guys. And um, yeah, I don't know, Stephen, is there anything else that, um, I don't know if we have a round of questions or is that it? Okay. Or you tell me. Can you, can, can you hear me, Isaac? Yeah, I can. Okay, I, I had to go to a different device because I mine crashed here. But yeah, oh, okay. any any questions from anyone? What's the code word? Oh, what's the code word? <laughs> what is, what is your favorite dessert, Isaac? What's my favorite dessert? Yeah. Oh man. Um... <laughs> You're asking the wrong person. I love dessert. Um, <laughs> no. um, I guess. <sighs> I don't know. I should have warned you. But There's you a Mexican it. one called Pastel de Tres Leches, but otherwise, no, I would go with strawberry cheesecake. I love strawberry cheesecake. Big fan. Cheesecake. There you go, everyone. There's okay. your code word for tonight. Strawberry cheese. Ah, okay. All right. <laughs> Attendance. <laughs> Isaac, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I wish I could have um, met you in person. But I really appreciate your audience and um, your participation and everything. Thank you very much. Yeah, likewise. Right, well, man. maybe we'll meet someday. And yeah, uh, let's hope so. Yeah. Best wishes to you. And, um, Everyone, I'll stay here for a while. If you have anything, thank you like for the art, about. man. It was a, uh, it was definitely, it was mind blowing. Okay, great, thank Very you. Very inspiring. I'm, I'm tempted to go make some music while just looking at the murals now. Ooh, that's a great idea. Great. Okay. I'll get some cheesecake. Yeah, get some cheesecake and make some music. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Isaac. Have, Have a, great a nice evening, evening, everyone. Bye. This was definitely an interesting one. Yeah, I thought so too. I really enjoyed the murals. Man, uh, Definitely shows a lot about the times they were in, like, and that was a lot of that was a big form of entertainment too, you know, art because we don't have the stuff we have now. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. Those those particular murals are 
pretty interesting. They're they're I've seen those in the Bellas Arts, and they're you know, they're just huge. You could just look at them for hours. Hours, yeah. <laughs> but that's what I was like. You could just sit there and just like literally just sit there and look at it because there's so much stuff you can depict from it. Yeah, exactly. There are, there are sometimes you know it's, it's class starts a little later in the evening. Sometimes it'll be a long day and you'll see something that says like you know, nationalism and Mexican muralism. And you're like, okay, got to get my notepad and buckle in. And then, and then sometimes you watch it, you get lost in it completely. And you're like, I'm very much enjoying this. This is not at all what uh, I may have thought in a cynical way at first. <laughs> yeah, you did a really great job with the subject. We are lucky. Hey, all these lectures have been good though. I mean, just different points and topics and different, you know, things to know i mean i've never known so i mean i learned a lot about from each person yeah Makes the world feel richer yeah me too we have one more left so i know tom it's going by too fast man that's right almost done yeah okay. but uh you looking forward to getting your getting some getting something to eat coming up next week well i'm about to leave on Friday morning early to drive across the country to, uh, to Oklahoma to see oh, my yeah. parents. And I'm taking my three kids with me. So we're uh, having an e epic road trip. <laughs> are you, uh, are you going, how long, how long is that going to take you? Are you going to like stop somewhere or are you just going to try and do a one shot? Well, it's 60 hours total of driving 30 out. 30 oh, okay. back so we'll probably do half one day and half the next 15 hours in a day well two of my sons drive so are you gonna you gonna yeah, swap we can switch tag on. team yeah. that sounds like a grand adventure <laughs> well hopefully not too much of an adventure but yeah how about you guys uh thanksgiving plans that's funny you're saying that. I'm I'm flying actually going out to Texas to go see my brother on um actually Thanksgiving Day. I'm actually in the morning. I'm gonna have to be leaving at like 12 a.m. Yeah. I'm probably, you, I don't get there till like eight. You're flying? Yeah. That's good. Expensive right now. I know. Yeah. But uh, the, um spending time with my uh extended family here, uh, having Thanksgiving at their home. I'm I'm not, uh, I'm an American citizen, but I've spent my whole life living in uh, my country of origin. So I, I came here to study and everything. So I'm kind of getting to experience all these American holidays for the first time in the proper country and uh, seeing how it all works for the first time versus just in my small home back uh, in my country. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Saudi Arabia, believe it or not. <laughs> But uh, my mom was Californian. Um, my father was from a small village there, and they moved to the, the capital, the big city um, in Saudi Arabia, so he could work as a, a banker. And we, we get a lot of um, Western holidays that kind of trickle in there because the people there, they, I want to say, because of all their time watching TV and, and Hollywood and listening to music and everything, they, they, they feel like they want to kind of be a bit more like America. Like they, they want to do Christmas and Thanksgiving and Halloween and try to emulate it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Got you. Um, they're, they're big on social media. So they see it all from abroad. They're like, let's do this. Let's try this. <laughs> you know? I, 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 um, so when's the last time you, uh, been out, been out there, been back. To I, I, so I uh, visited the States a few times this is the first time i'm like living here on my own I, I left my family um back home to pursue education here and uh, uh get the opportunities um that are afforded to me by being lucky enough to have a have citizenship here so the last time i saw or spoke to my family was maybe um seven months now got you so but it's uh, it's interesting it's it's cool seeing this 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 country that it makes up the other half of my heritage. Yeah, seeing the way it functions and how everything is. Yeah. 
there's, there's like a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of different things too. It's, it's taking me some time to kind of get into the groove of everything. Yeah. And I hear you, but, but it's, we'll, it's very nice. I know we keep talking, but what's up, Thompson? <laughs> so, well, guys, I'm probably going to have to shut it down. All right. He said, I'm about to cut y'all off, man. Get out, get out, get out my zoom. <laughs> All right. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Yeah. yeah, have a good evening. Good seeing everybody. All right, you have a good night. Have a safe Thanksgiving. All right, you too.